Hey, thanks for tuning in for another episode of Social Distancing Story Time. We've all made it through another week. Um, today I'm up in my bedroom because the kids are just finishing lunch and playing around and I think they'll come visit soon. They are dressed up as a couple of favorite princesses because it's a rainy day here and so they got to do a special fun Friday and watch a little bit of a movie this morning. When they come up, we'll see if you can guess what it was. All right, so let's start with Big Girl Panties by Fran Mnuchin, illustrated by Valeria Patron. Bye-bye, diapers. I wear panties. Happy panties, snappy panties. Panties, panties, hip hip hooray. Panties for every single day. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. Panties with rainbows and ducks in a line. Princess panties that sparkle and shine. No little baby, you can't wear panties. Only big girls wear panties. I can prance in my panties and dance in my panties. No crocodile, you can't wear panties. And is that where panties go? No. Only big girls can wear panties. Mommies and grandmas and aunties wear panties and I wear panties. Polka dot panties, purple, pink, or white. I wear panties day and night. Do you wear panties? Yeah, you do. Well, guess what? You're a big girl too. Oh, let's put that up there. Okay. All right. Now we've got Hans Christian Andersen's The White Swan. without blowing it out so you can see it. Okay, once there lived a king who had 11 sons and a young daughter named Elisa. The family was very happy together until their mother, the queen, died. The king married again, but his new queen was not kind or loving to his children. It was not long before the queen sent Elisa away to live with an old couple in the forest. Here we go. This is just too bright by this window. Let me fix that. Okay, so it was not long before the queen sent Elisa away to live with an old couple in the forest. Fly out into the world and get your own living. The wicked queen said to Elisa's brothers, she cast an evil spell which turned the princes into swans. With a strange cry, they flew out of the palace windows and far away. The years passed, and Elisa missed her brothers. One day, as she wandered alone in the forest, she met an old woman. Have you ever seen eleven princes riding through these woods? she asked. No, replied the old woman, but I have seen eleven swans floating on the river. Elisa ran to the river and waited. When the sun began to set, eleven swans flew down and settled on the riverbank. As soon as the sun disappeared, the swan's feathers fell off, and eleven handsome princes stood there. Elisa knew that they were her brothers and ran to them with a happy cry. How glad they were to be together once again! But sadly, the next morning, the princes were turned into swans again, for only at night could they be human. And they told Elisa that the time of year had come with its long summer days when they must fly back to their home beyond the sea. We cannot leave you here, they said. So that night, they wove a net of willow bark and reeds and carried Elisa in it over the seas, by sundown the second day, they landed on the shores of a beautiful country. There, the princess found Elisa a dry cave to sleep in. 
she dreamed of the old woman who had told her of the eleven swans. In her dream, Elisa asked her, How can I help release my brothers from the evil spell? The old woman said, Take courage, Elisa. You must pick stinging nettles and break them up with your feet. Weave the nettles into eleven coats. When you put the coats on your brothers, they will be freed from the evil spell. But the hardest part is this. You must work without speaking, for if you speak before the coats are finished, your brothers will not live to become human again. Elisa woke immediately to find a nettle in her hand. She ran out to the fields to gather more nettles, which stung her delicate fingers, but she would not stop until she had gathered enough to make the coats. Elisa worked by the light of the moon all that night, stamping the nettles with her feet and then weaving the thread. The next day, after the brothers had turned back into swans and flown off, Elisa made two coats. All would have been well, but a party of hunters found her. One of the huntsmen was the king of that country. He was enchanted by Elisa's beauty and asked her many questions about herself. But Elisa would not speak. "'You cannot stay here alone in the woods,' said the king. "'Come with me. I will bring you to my castle, where you will be safe.'" Elisa wept as she rode through the mountains on the king's horse, far away from her brothers. Each day, ladies-in-waiting dressed Elisa in beautiful gowns and wove pearls in her hair, but Elisa could only think of her poor brothers waiting for her to help them. The eleven swans swam sadly on the river near the castle. Elisa waved to them each day at sunset as they flew off to the forest for the night. Her brothers wanted to visit her, but they were afraid that the king would be angry with Elisa for welcoming eleven visiting princes. The king, knowing Elisa was unhappy, sent for the nettle thread and the coats that she had made. The sight of them made Elisa feel better. She fell to work at once, and soon she had knitted ten coats. But then Elisa had no thread left. She bravely crept out of the castle at midnight to find more nettles. A wicked prince had secretly watched Elisa leave the castle. He told the king and his court that Elisa was a witch. Why else would she leave the castle at midnight to pick stinging nettles, he asked. The king was troubled by what he had heard. Speak if you are innocent, he commanded Elisa. But she dared not reply, for the last coat was not finished. As the court argued about what to do with Elisa, she slipped away and ran to her room. Elisa worked quickly to finish the last coat before the eleven swans had to fly to the forest for the night. The sun was low in the sky as she finished the last coat. She gathered up all eleven coats and ran toward the river, hoping no one would see her. But no sooner was she outside than a, gate, uh, than a crowd spotted her and began to chase her. Elisa arrived at the river just as the swans were lifting their wings to fly away to the forest. Wait, brothers, she called. The swans settled in a ring around her, their sister to protect her. Elisa tossed the coats over the swans' heads, and immediately they were transformed into eleven splendid princes. Elisa then turned to the king. Now I may speak, she said, for my brothers are saved. And she told the king the story of the spell her brothers had been under, and all she had done to release them from it. As Elisa spoke, the garden burst into bloom and the scent of roses filled the air. Now everyone knew that Elisa was not a witch. At the king's elbow swayed a white rose. He picked it and put it into Elisa's hands. You are as pure as this rose, he said, and I want you to be my bride. Elisa could smile at last, and no one was ever as happy as Elisa and the king on their wedding day. Hey, Eve, we have plenty of books to read. Have a seat. Come here, buddy. <laughs> Well, we have these three books to read now, okay? Oh, well, we'll, hey, buddy, we'll figure it out, okay? Hey, Eve, we can read it again, okay? But right now we're going to read these three, okay? Can you say, can you say hi, everybody? No. 
can you say, I'm kind of a grumpy kid? No. You see, I said it and I did nothing. Okay, I won't make you say it. Eve, is your name Eve or are you dressed up as someone else today? I'm dressed up as no one. As no one? No. But it looks like you have a beautiful dress from Arendelle on. I don't. Oh, you're not? You're not no. Anna of Arendelle? No. Oh, okay. My mistake. Should we try Bunny Goes to School? No. Oh, we should not try it? I want to like this one. Okay. All right. Well, then let's try this one. Sarah Bella's thinking cap. Sarabella had no time for small talk. In fact, she never talked much at all because she was too busy thinking. She thought about big things and small things. And oodles of in-between things, like ants and uncles. And cats. And doodles of poodles and cats. You already said that. Yeah, you're, no, I was agreeing with you. What do you no, no, you okay. were. You were being me. I wasn't being me. You what do you think, being Pinky? Me. Pinky's thoughts would remain a mystery, but there was nothing mysterious about her family. They loved puppets, painting pictures, and playing guitar. Most of all, they loved their Sarah Bella just the way she was with her feet on the ground and her head in the clouds. To Sarah Bella, there was nowhere she would rather be than dreaming of painted ponies racing across the sky. Some ideas came as a complete surprise to her, <laughs> while other notions... Hey, hey, where's, where's the parents? I don't know. Maybe on the next page. Let's see. While other notions were coddled and cared for like rare plants in a well-loved garden. <laughs> I need to read up on you, mister. There was never a doubt that Sarah Bella had a green <laughs> thumb for thinking. The problem was, no one ever knew what she was thinking about. Her teacher, Mr. Fantosi, had a knack for knowing just what Sarah Bella wasn't thinking about, and that was schoolwork. Oh, okay, you getting comfy? Okay. No. Okay, bud. I want to snuggle. You want to snuggle? Okay, that's cool. And that was schoolwork. Sometimes all it took was a word, a sound, or the scent of Samantha's magic markers to carry her thoughts away. And that's when Mr. F, who was really very nice, had to send her home with another note. And this made Sarah Bella feel terrible. The notes never upset her parents, because once upon a time, they got sent home with notes too. Really, said Sarah Bella? Really, replied her mom. You have daydreams in your DNA. What do the notes say? Let's see. Teacher's comments. Sarah Bella needs to find a way to focus and finish her work on time. Sarah Bella needs to spend more time thinking about schoolwork and less time thinking about unicorns, kittens, and clouds. Not that there is anything wrong with those things. Sarah Bella is well-behaved and thoughtful, but her head is in the clouds. She needs a pair of heavy shoes. Sarah Bella disappeared today. Must learn to focus. We'd all love to know what Sarah Bella is thinking about. Hmm. At bedtime, Sarah Bella cuddled up with her big sister, Cece. I wish I knew how to focus, said Sarah Bella. It's easy, said Cece. All you have to do is take deep breaths and squint. At school the next day, Sarah Bella followed her sister's advice, but all she got was a dizzy spell and a visit to the school nurse for an eye test because she was squinting. Oh, boy. One night, during a math facts memorizing meltdown, a bear of thought dropped by for a chat. Does it say what? No, he says, I have a good head for numbers, he said. I can see that, replied Sarah Bella. Keep me in, Keep me in mind if you ever need help, said the bear. I'll consider it, said Sarah Bella. And that was her first mistake. The second was taking the bear to school the next day. I sure hope you left some room in your head for math facts, said her sister. There was always room in Sarah Bella's brain for one more tantalizing thought. Just not math facts. By the time they arrived in class, the bear had fallen asleep. 
but waiting in the wings was an odd flock of birds who didn't know the difference between an egg and the number eight. Uh oh. And that's when she heard Mr. F calling out her nickname. Earth to cerebellum, he said. A penny for your thoughts. She's not thinking, said Russell. She's daydreaming. Daydreaming is an awesome kind of thinking, said Mr. F, but not during class. That afternoon, Sarah Bella stayed in at recess to catch up on her work. She liked sitting at the round table in the quiet room. I know you can do this, Sarah Bella, said Mr. F, handing her the very last quiz. Just put on your thinking cap and focus. Sarah Bella began to imagine what her thinking cap might look like. And then she turned back to her papers. Right before the bell rang, Mr. F had Sarah Bella hand out the weekend assignment. They were always something fun. What do you think, Sarah Bella? asked Mr. F. An otter popped into her mind, but that was just the first thing. Oh, do you see what the assignment is? It says, a penny for your thoughts. Draw a picture of your favorite daydreams. That's a great assignment for Sarah Bella. Before she even got home, kissed Pinky, and put on her comfy bunny slippers, Sarah Bella had already thought of a thousand extraordinary things. By dinner time, she'd run out of paper, had an upset tummy, and a great big mess on her hands. This looks like she's drawing a lot of things. She's drawn a lot of pictures, hasn't she? That night, just as Sarah Bella was about to give up, a whale of a thought appeared on the horizon. The closer it got... Oh, don't she has pink bunny. Oh. The closer it got, the more beautiful but, it became. But, but yeah, the pink nose, it's the bunny. Yeah. And though it was the most enormous creature she had ever seen, Sarah Bella felt unafraid. Do you know what I think? asked the whale. I can see what you think, replied Sarah Bella. And so should everyone else, said the whale. To share it, just gotta wear it. Then the whale blew Sarah Bella a kiss before she swam off. This gave Sarah Bella an idea. She found a brown paper bag and a ruler for measuring. Then she rounded up some old magazines, pretty papers, pencils, pastels, stickers, and stamps, along with her favorite drawings. For the rest of the night, she clipped and colored, pasted and painted until her project was done. Monday morning, everyone was eager to share their weekend project. A penny for your thoughts, said Mr. F, as the kids sat crisscross applesauce on the floor. Who's going first? To the surprise of all, it was Sarah Bella. If you want to share it, she said, standing up in front of the class, you've just got to wear it. What do you think she's going to wear? Listen. And that's exactly what Sarah Bella did. When she placed the most spectacular collection of doodles and daydreams right on top of her head. So that's what you've been thinking, the kids said in awe. Lara saw unicorns and Zavi saw planets. Dylan saw a cat, a snake, and a feather, while Nate reported seeing clouds with a touch of bad weather. A penny for your thoughts, Mr. F, said Sarah Bella. I think, he said with a smile, your thoughts are worth more than all the pennies in the world. Hey, Evie, cool it with the, cool it with this, cool it, cool it. On Tuesday, Bob came to school wearing a thinking cap of his own. Sarah Bella really liked it. We have a lot in common, said Bob. My thoughts exactly, said Sarah Bella. Cool. All right. No, we nope, Evie, we already read that one. We can read it after, but we have these two to finish first. Bedtime for sweet creatures? Okay. Okay. This one is by Nikki Grimes and Elizabeth Zunin. Hey, that's a library book. It's not a library book, no. It's our book. Oh, okay. I don't need my tea plant anymore. Okay, all right. No, no, no. Is that what that kid is saying? Yeah. No, 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 no. You beat the word like a drum. The minute I say, come sweet creature, it's bedtime. That's kind of like you, Evie. Yeah. Yeah. Your eyes swell, wide as owls. Let's go, I say. Who, 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 you ask, as if you didn't know. 
bear is going, I say. He'll be awfully lonely without you. Suddenly, you come running. In the forest of your room, you cling to bear. I turn back the sheets and you growl. In you both go, I say. You coil beneath the quilt, silent as a snake. Why are you hiding, I ask? Monsters, you hiss. All gone, I trumpet. You're safe. You toss your mane and roar. Order me to check beneath the bed. I kneel on the forest floor, find something wild and ferocious. Meow. What did she find? A cat. A cat. Your bookshelf is noisy with stories. Which one, I ask? You point, frozen like a fawn, until you hear, once upon a time. You yawn and grind your teeth like a squirrel, ready to nibble the night. I am not sleepy, you tell me. I smile and tuck you in tight. A koala, you hang on to me for one last kiss. I love you, mummy. I love you more. Okay, lights out, I say. Fearless tiger, you crouch just in case, ready to pounce on goblins in the dark. Later, you bound out of bed, sly wolf on the hunt for water. Hurry, I whisper from the kitchen door. Last glass. You lope back to bed before Bear can miss you. Bathroom, you say out loud and hop up once again. Good night, I call. Silence falls over the house. Dad and I slip into our bed, half asleep. We hear one small toddler whisper, Mommy, can I sleep with you? I sigh and pull back the blanket. Come on, I say. And in crawl owl, bear, snake, kitty, fawn, squirrel, koala, tiger, wolf. And one very sleepy child. Yep, we'll read that in a minute. Okay. Now we're going to read Bunny's Book Club Goes to School by Annie Silvestro, illustrated by Tatiana Mai Wiss. Bunny's Book Club... Bunny's book club met at the library every Saturday. Bunny and his forest friends arrived even before the librarian. They couldn't wait to return the books they had borrowed and to pick out new ones. Can you turn it, Bunny? Yeah. Hold on. They always found lots to do at the library. Porcupine had discovered arts and crafts, and Bird loved the audiobooks. Raccoon typed at the computer, while Bear and Mouse nosed through cookbooks, and Frog put puzzles together. Squirrel searched the highest shelves as Mole mined below. And Bunny, well, Bunny had made a new book buddy. A little girl named Josie also came to the library every Saturday. She recommended books to Bunny and helped him with the hard words. Bunny loved Josie almost as much as he loved books. His friends loved her, too. Hey, that was my page. Oh, are you going to turn it? No. Okay, can you turn it for me so I can read the next one? No, you turn it. Okay. I, I don't like it. Okay. One crisp, next, cool day. This one is That one's day. yours? Okay. Josie slumped down into the pillow pile beside Bunny. I start my new school next week, she said. Bunny's ears perked up. He had read all about school. I'm so nervous, she continued. What if I don't make any friends? Who wouldn't want to be your friend, sputtered Bunny. Bunny hated to see Josie worry. He wanted to help. But how? That night, as he hopped into bed, an idea popped into his head. Josie needed a friend. Bunny was a friend. That was it! Turn the page. Good job. Thanks, dude. Hey, I didn't do that. Yeah, you did. You threw it. No, no. And then you caught it, and then no, not night. Okay, you can do the next one. Monday morning, Bunny bounced out the door and right into Porcupine. Where are you off to? Porcupine asked. School, said Bunny. It's Josie's first day, and she needs a friend. I'm her friend, said Porcupine. I'll come, too. I suppose two friends are better than one, said Bunny. So off they went. Along the way, they bumped into Bear. We're going to school, said Porcupine. Want to come? Oh, brother, said Bunny. 
Don't get your whiskers in a twist, said Porcupine. Three friends are better than two. Turn it. Whoops. I don't like it. Yep, you, you threw the book. Oh, careful. There you got it. Good. But then three friends turned into four, then five, then six, seven, eight, and nine. You got to be careful, buddy. Okay. Just take the one page. Go for it. All right. <laughs> When their crowd reached the town, Bunny came to a halt. School was bigger than he'd thought. He scanned the crowd and shook his head. No way we're going to find her, he said. Then as the last of the students swarmed inside, Bunny spotted Josie. There she is, he called. Let's go. The animals quickly darted after her, but by the time they reached the door, Josie was gone. Turn the page. Where is Josie gone? She went into her classroom, I guess. They peeked into classroom after classroom. That's her, said Squirrel. Everyone tumbled into the gymnasium. But it wasn't Josie. A ball whizzed over their heads. They couldn't resist jumping in and dodging and dunking until Bunny blew a whistle. We have a job to do, he said. Come on. The animals hurried out, except for Squirrel. I'm going to hang out here just another minute, she said. Turn the page. Hey, hey, it, it fell. I didn't do it. I was just handing it to you. You turn it, please. Thank you. A song floated down the hall. Bird followed the notes. I think it's Josie, she trilled in tune, and she fluttered into the music room. But it was another false alarm. I'll stay here to help with the harmony for a bit, said Bird. Turn the page. Just then, a delicious smell wafted through the air. All the searching is making me hungry, said Bear. Maybe Josie's having lunch. But she wasn't. Oh, uh, we'll catch up with you, said Bear. Mm-hmm, mumbled Mouse. Every time they thought they saw her, it turned out to be a mistake. And worse, Bunny's friends kept getting distracted. Evie, I can't read if you do that. Raccoon crept... Stop. Raccoon crept into the computer room. Frog leapt into the water fountain. Mole dug into the science lab. And still, there was no sign of Josie. Okay, turn the page. Looks like it's just you and me, porcupine, sighed Bunny. Porcupine? But Bunny was too late. Porcupine had dipped into the art room, and now he was stuck. I suppose one friend is better than none, said Bunny sadly. He continued down the corridor, and that's when he saw it. Bunny's heart hopped. Turn the page. What was it? He burst into the school's library. It smelled like home. He spotted his favorite book, then another and another. There were new stories, too, just waiting to be read. Bunny gleefully ran his paws across them all. Then he paused at the end of the shelves. Turn the page. Just then, porcupine, bird, frog, bear, mouse, mole, raccoon, and squirrel toppled into the library. We knew we'd find you here, said porcupine. It's Josie, shouted Bunny, pointing to the playground. Look! Do you see her out there? Yeah, turn the page. Bear held open the back door. The animals ran out and dashed in to the jungle gym. They caused quite a kerfluffle, which caused Josie to look up and smile. She hugged her friends, and they hugged her right back. Turn the page. Want to play, asked Josie. You bet, said Bunny. Soon everyone joined in the fun. Bear caused a bit of a delay. They raced and chased all around until recess was over. Did Bear get stuck in the slide? Yeah. Before heading back inside, Josie grabbed Bunny's paw. Thank you, she whispered. Bunny beamed. Josie lined up with her class. See you Saturday, she called. Bunny waved goodbye. He could see Josie had made lots of new friends. Turn the page. And so had he. Okay. That's the end. All right, let's we'll read the other book in a minute. Can we say can we say thanks for tuning in? No. Oh, can I say thanks for tuning in? Oh, from a grumpy three-year-old, you get grumpy thanks. Thanks for tuning in. See you next time. Bye.